Tom, unmute yourself and uh, start us off. You're muted, Tom. There you okay. go. Got me? Yeah. All righty. Um, first thing I'm going to do is just compare the numbers for your class when you applied to Williams. There were 1,602 applicants to the class of 67, 469 were accepted, and 302 of you matriculated. Now I'm going to talk about the class of 2026 that was just admitted. Whereas you had 1,602, this year there were 15,321 applicants, which is even to me who's witnessed this evolution, a mind boggling figure um, and a figure that I would makes me glad that I'm in retirement because I don't know how on earth anybody deals with those kinds of numbers. There were 1300 acceptances and in the fall it'll be 600, 590 to 600 uh, first year students at Williams. So the contrast is extraordinary. And it's very easy to make a joke here and say, good Lord, they must be so much smarter than you are uh, given the competition, but I won't make that joke because I could make it on my own class and myself as well. Um, the other thing, the second thing I'd like to talk about, and Larry alluded to this, um, the sheer wealth of the institution, the endowment now stands at $4.2 billion. And I think by the end of the fiscal year, it'll be 4.567, something in the range. That is a figure, again, that is almost unfathomable to me, who's, who's spent 30 some odd years in, in higher ed. And it does two things, I think. Number one, it allows Williams College in admission to be anything that it wants to be. There are no fiscal limitations whatsoever. If it wants to win the Sears Cup, it can win the Sears Cup annually. If it wants to have every student be a potential Phi Beta Kappa student, it has that option. If it wants to be a diverse student body that reflects the racial and socioeconomic status of this country, it can do that. Um, there are very, very few colleges and universities in, in the United States that are in that position. Um, and to give you some sense, my my wife is also in admission and still a part-time reader for Skidmore, but for many years was the director of admission at Hampshire College, which has an endowment of very little. Um, <laughs> and when we talked about our days at the end of the day, as, as spouses do, the contrast <laughs> in, in her choices and my choices were astonishing. I mean, it, it, was a, it was a completely different kind of job. And her work was more representative of the field than my work. I live in a kind of a dream world in a certain sense at, at both institutions. Now, having said that, to have this kind of wealth in terms of dollars and cents, but also wealth in terms of the quality of the personnel, the, the administration is extraordinary. The faculty is extraordinary comes an enormous amount of responsibility. Um, if we have these choices, I think they have to be good choices, morally defensible choices, and happily, I've watched Williams evolve over time and been involved, and I, and I think there is a kind of, of guidance and wisdom about the choices that are made that, that, that I think you all should be proud of, and I'm certainly proud of. Um, my own story, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about it because it inevitably informed um, choices that were made in terms of admission policy at both Williams and, and Amherst. Um, it wasn't that I could make admission policy. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, but certainly I was a participant and my own background, I think, informed choices that I advocated for. Um, my mother was one of 10 children of immigrants, um, grew up genuinely poor, and there's no other way to uh, explain it, uh, did not go to college, certainly went to work as a telephone operator um, in Madison, Wisconsin, um, 
and work not to support herself, but work to support the family. She and her sister um, were both telephone operators. And as she just so often said to us, brought home her paycheck and gave it to my grandmother. And she was permitted to keep a dollar for um, beer and cigarettes, I guess. Um, my dad grew up on a farm in upstate New York um, and did all the things that farmers' sons do in terms of chores and whatnot. Uh, went to Springfield College and uh, got a degree in physical education uh, and became a coach and uh, a physical education teacher. Um, he worked for 40 years um, at Poly Prep School in Brooklyn. So despite having not a great deal of money and not a lot of great sophistication in my family, I was permitted to go to poly prep for free um, from fifth grade through 12th grade. So I, I, I fall into that category that now is called the privileged poor, which means essentially, in my case, I had the fourth largest uh, financial aid package in my class, the class of 69 at Williams. But on the other hand, I had a superb education and did not experience the kind of shock upon arriving in English 101 that many of us uh, experienced. I, I, I had a very, very fine education, but I was aware then certainly and, and have become increasingly aware of, you know, the profound effect that Williams has on a person of, of my background in particular. Um, had it not been for poly prep school, I, I, I don't think I ever would have even known that Williams College existed. So um, I, I, when we talk about policy, uh, that, that weighs very, very heavily on me and increasingly over the years did so. Um, after I graduated from, from Harvard, um, I took a job at Marshfield High School as an English teacher. Um, and again, it, this is a very important part of how I think about education admission, you know, the niche that Williams happens to be in. Marshfield High School was an absolutely typical American comprehensive high school, had 2000 students, broad range of socioeconomic backgrounds, racially not terribly diverse, um, and I taught all four levels. Uh, I taught an advanced placement course. I taught a level one course, a level two course, and a level three course. It was quite rigidly tracked. And I bring this up because in my advanced placement course, there were 25 students representing roughly 5% of the, of, of, of the class. Um, and they shone like diamonds. They were extraordinary. I would have gladly taught them for free. Um, they came to school well prepared. Uh, it wasn't unusual if they enjoyed a, a novel to ask me if there were other novels by the author and I would suggest it. They read beyond the curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. Out of those 25, perhaps three, four, or five would have been competitive in the admission pool at Williams. Um, the others went to other very fine schools, did well. 10 of them are still Facebook friends. Um, they've had terrific careers. But all of that kind of gave me the perspective on just what I was dealing with. And what can happen at these very elite schools is that you can, you can very easily drift into a kind of dream world that, you know, everybody is like, William students and everybody's like me and everybody can do these things. But even among this elite group that um, at this comprehensive public high school, only two, three, four or five of them would have gotten into Williams or would have even been considered for Williams. So you're talking about a very, very, very narrow slice of the population. Um, and occasionally when I would find staff or coaches or somebody kind of demeaning or uh, bemoaning, you know, the entry of an athlete or somebody else from a, you know, a less strong socioeconomic background. I always said, well, that, that would have been somebody who was in, you know, level one that I was teaching. And I was, that was 
equally enjoyable. And I, I keep that perspective and um, always. I'm gonna move now to the key developments that took place at Williams during my time there. Um, and the first I'm gonna start with is what was called the Financial Aid Task Force. Um, about my third or fourth year, Steve Lewis, who many of you might remember, went on to become the Car uh, Carlton president, was the provost. Um, Williams is a member of a, an, an, of a group called the Consortium on Funding Higher Education that shares detail, just extraordinary amounts of detail. And Steve was the recipient of um, what's called the Blue Book. Um, and Phil Smith, my predecessor, was also the recipient. And Steve looked at the data and discovered that of all of these institutions, and Kofi is 32 of the most competitive and wealthiest um, colleges and universities in the country. And Steve realized that Williams ranks second from the bottom in the percentage of kids receiving aid from the college, um, which was a disturbing figure for Steve, who's a brilliant man, a brilliant economist, but also a first generation student, first generation college student at Williams from the Buffalo area. And he just asked the question, why? Um, and really, there was no satisfactory answer that the admission office was able to, to give him. Um, so he formed something called the Financial Aid Task Force, which was a group of key administrators, certainly including Williams, or certainly including the Dean and Associate Dean at the time, Phil Smith and I, um, the Deep Director of Admission, Dean of the Faculty, some of the most distinguished uh, faculty, and it was an extraordinary group. Out of that group came five different college presidents, if you can believe it. So among, among the 12 people sitting around the Tom, you muted. You, you muted yourself. Again, it's muted. Tom, I muted you by mistake. I was trying to mute uh, Don Steinmuller and you got muted. There you go. Okay, okay we're back on track. Yeah. No, Tom, could you do us a favor? Could you give us a year? I have no de idea what decade you're talking about. What okay, year are sure. you talking I'm, about? I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, that, yeah. that would have been in 1983. Hey, Tom, I got a request. There's some kind of weird reflection on your glasses off your screen that's driving me crazy. Can you talk without your glasses on? I can talk. I can't see, but <laughs> sure. <laughs> or maybe change, no the ang change the angle of your screen or something. No, I, I've taken my glasses off. and Okay, thank you. I'll be okay. I hope I'm more attractive as well. But anyway, that would, have been in, that would have been in 1983. Um, and the goal was to increase that number from 32% to 40%, which would have been the mean. Um, out of that group, the, the, the uh, Financial Aid Task Force became a, a working group called the Advisory Group on Admission and Financial Aid that was headed by Steve and then subsequently by the people that followed Steve as the provost. And that was the first time that there was genuine governance of the financial aid operation and the admission operation, where people were able to talk about, are we satisfied with the gender ratio? Are we satisfied with the number of athletes that are being admitted? How are they being admitted? Are we satisfied with the racial and socioeconomic diversity? Uh, what are our goals? Um, and that body for the first time made the admission process at Williams absolutely transparent. Um, before that, because so many of the admission issues are, are vexing and uh, difficult, there was a tendency, I think, to play the cards pretty close to, to the vest. 
And what that did, I think, was give everybody permission uh, to inquire about what we were doing, how we were doing it, what our specific goals were. Happily, Williams at the time and continues to be the case has one of the best, if not the best, um, research uh, arms in, in higher education. So the director of uh, research, David Booth, sat on that. And it was just when we were beginning to develop you know, a sophisticated database and the kinds of tools that could be used to extract data and compute in various ways. That was happening simultaneously and David was right on top of it. Uh, so we were finally able to say, if we do X, what will happen? If we do Y, what will happen? If we do too much of this, who will be excluded? If we don't do enough of that, how will we be hurt? So we were able for the first time to really begin pretty primitively uh, to model and to uh, look at scenarios and to uh, have very coherent objectives. And that changed everything and had a, a profound effect on the way that I thought about admission. And you know, I'm committed utterly right now to transparency um, because I saw the, what happened with the lack of transparency. Just to use an example, we, we, I'll talk about athletes. And I'll, I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Um, I discovered that once, People said, you know, these 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 folks are athletic admits. The natural um, question was going to be, well, how many of them are there? What do they look like? What do they look like in comparison to their peers? Um, how many women? How many men? And that gave us a forum to be utterly transparent. And it was really, really interesting to see the reaction of the faculty because we had not been transparent before that. I think they thought the worst. Um, and once they saw what it actually, they said, oh, these, these are pretty good kids. And you say, absolutely, they're pretty good kids. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, yeah, they would be in the, you know, the top six or 7% of the kids that I taught at Marshall High School. Would they have necessarily gotten into Williams? No. Were they terrific kids? Yes. Um, so that was a real, real, real sea change. And, and I think a very healthy one. And I don't think anybody would uh, disagree with me. Um, at the same time, um, the whole concept of marketing came into play. Um, and this would, again, to, to get back to a date would be mid eighties. Um, prior to that marketing would have been a kind of dirty word, particularly among the faculty, you know, the idea that, that such an esteemed institution would market itself, market itself would have seemed to have been kind of sleazy in a certain sense. Um, and for me, exam when I, for example, when I went to national conferences, all of the conf all the conference sessions I went to would have had to do with selection, would have had to do with whom, whom we're competing with, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, when marketing became okay, I was going to sessions on, you know, the quality of our printed matter, uh, direct mail, and all of a sudden I'm thinking about what, what kind of envelope is likely to be opened and um, suddenly thinking, you know, look, well, when I look at our view book, it's really kind of amateurish, isn't it? Uh, and it was genuinely amateurish. And then we then did all the kinds of things, survey-based research, um, uh, focus groups, all the things that most industries would do um, and dramatically increase the quality of our um, our our view book, uh, printed matter of all kinds, communication of all kinds, um, became much more hospitable to visitors. Uh, we were probably passive and reactionary uh, or reactive um, in in my early years at Williams, and suddenly we said we've really got to think about hosting people. Um, I discovered that the Purple Key hosts who were volunteers and tour guides were almost exclusively from very privileged backgrounds because they weren't holding other campus jobs. So instead of just saying, relying on the goodwill of kids, and they were again, marvelous kids, don't ever think that I'm singling out any particular group for criticism. They were wonderful kids, but they weren't, it wasn't a socioeconomically 
rich or, or diverse group. So we started to pay the tour guides and we paid them at the highest rate uh, that the college could. And that uh, changed the, the composition of our tour guides to make it much more representative. Uh, in the early days, an acceptance letter went out in April. Um, students replied on May 1st. Um, whether they visited campus or not in that period to make up their minds um, was kind of an afterthought, frankly. Um, we just thought, okay, if they come up, they come up and they visit, they visit, fine. Uh, and then change that dramatically to, to two different two day periods for visitors, accepted students, uh, where there were panels and whatnot. Um, and we were not alone in this, you know, this whole marketing revolution, same thing was happening at Yale, same thing was happening at Princeton, same thing was happening at Stanford, but it changed the nature of the work quite dramatically. Um, and the, the reaching out that we did became much more important to us. Um, the final thing that uh, has taken place at Williams uh, and, and it is significant is that Williams followed Amherst in providing grant aid for students rather than loans, okay? Which was a very significant effect. And Amherst did it first, followed by Williams. Yeah, I, 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 I love the rivalry and I love this part of the rivalry the most, which is, you know, let's, let's compete to do the right thing. Um, let's, let's, let's play football in early November, but let's, let's compete to do the right thing because Amherst is, is as wealthy as, as, as Williams and it's important. The following year, Amherst eliminated loans for all students uh, and replaced them with grant aid. Williams quickly followed, as did Dartmouth, as did Brown, uh, as did Bowdoin, as did a number of other institutions. And again, that's the way I like to compete. And it's, it's a much more enlightened way, you know, uh, I suppose, than winning a NESCAC championship or whatever it might be. Um, Williams this year took the extraordinary step um, of eliminating for financial aid students, not only loans, but jobs and the summer expectation. Uh, and that's an extraordinary move. And, a, and a, to me, at least a, a very good and enlightened one in that I think institutions have diversified themselves really quite admirably. And I think now we're talking about student life issues. What does it mean? We've got a diverse student body. And what does this mean for campus life? Um, and what does it mean when, you know, I, I contrast my summer experiences with um, my roommates. I, you know, I was unloading trucks at Abraham and Strauss department store in Brooklyn. Um, you know, my roommate was playing in the Cape Cod baseball league um, and not earning a dime. And between junior and senior year, had an unpaid internship in an international law firm in Paris. Um, and the contrast is extraordinary. Um, you know, we were great friends and continue to be great friends, but our experiences outside of the classroom at Williams Beyond Athletics was, was really quite different. And so there's a kind of a leveling of the play, playing field, but also this gives a kid who who instead of unloading trucks at A&S department store might get a, uh, a, a an internship in a, in a law firm in New York City um, or may have the opportunity to travel through some sort of uh, program that, that, that they earn. So, um, and I can tell you Williams led the way this year with this particular initiative. Um, I know that Amherst will follow. I, it's, um, it's something that'll happen. I know that Brown will follow. I know that Dartmouth will follow. I know that Columbia will follow. Um, and it's a, it's a very good thing and something that we should be very, very proud of. Um, now, moving to Amherst, why did I do it? <laughs> um, I'd been at 20 years at Williams. I, I was very, very, very happy. I had a wonder, wonderful staff, wonderful working relationship with the coaches and the uh, faculty and um, 
staff, uh, lovely home. It's a great place to, to live. Um, as I said, my wife was uh, the director of admission at Hampshire College, so we had a commuting marriage, um, which when you get to be your 50s, it, it's, it's genuinely kind of un, unhealthy. Um, too much wine, too much coffee, eating too late, all sorts of you know, downsides of, of, of that kind of existence. And uh, there's a great deal of travel involved in admission and we could never get it coordinated. So um, that, that, was, that was on my mind. Um, the other thing, as I said before, when I was talking about the Faculty Committee on Admission and Financial Aid, um, things were settled at Williams. I mean, it, it really was. I didn't come in to work in the morning with the idea that there would be something really difficult to solve. Our, our budgets were more than adequate. Um, I was happy, I had a wonderful staff. So there was, there was no unhappiness. Um, I was actually approached by Amherst. Um, I knew the job of Dean of Admission and Financial Aid was open. Um, I did not envision myself applying for it. I, I, I kind of said, you know, they're never gonna hire a Williams guy to do this and, you know, they think that I'm some kind of spy or something. Um, and so I, I didn't apply um, and was approached uh, by the current uh, Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Amherst, Katie Fretwell, who had worked with me at Williams, ironically, for a couple of years and said, would you be interested in the job? And I was flabbergasted. I, I frankly was. I said, are, are you serious? Um, and I said, I, I really have to think about it. Um, you know, I'm happy here. Uh, I, and I went home and I thought about it and said, you know, what the heck? Phil Smith had given me advice years ago. You know, if you've got any kind of a lead, explore it. Um, so I, I had been offered the job at uh, Carlton and Oberlin when I was an associate uh, director at, at Williams. And, you know, in one case, I, I, I was not particularly interested in the other case I was, but Phil said, by all means, get out there, go through the process, you'll learn a lot, you'll make a decision. So I, that's kind of guided me. So I said, okay, what the heck? It's an hour and 15 minutes away. I can get in a car, I can spend the day there and uh, go through the interview process. Um, so you know, before I even went down there, I got a call from the, the head of the board uh, at Amherst. And I said, oh my gosh, this, this is really serious. Um, you know, they're taking the position incredibly seriously. That means something. Um, and the fact that he would call me directly said, you know, they must be serious about conceivably hiring me. Um, I went down to Amherst and there were two things that struck me. Um, the financial aid office was in terrific shape. There was a fellow named Joe Paul Case who was the Dean of Financial Aid and was you know, genuinely the top figure in the United States in terms of knowledge and perspective and uh, the way he looked at things. So there was no problem there. Unlike Williams, Amherst had had a history after having a legendary Dean of Admission and Financial Aid named Eugene Wilson um, of real instability in the office. Uh, you know, directors staying for two years, uh, a pulling and a tugging, and um, it, there was a real lack of continuity. Um, and now you contrast that for a moment. I don't know if any of you have thought about that. There were there have only been to this date five deans of admission in the history of the college, literally five. That's Fred Copeland, Phil Smith, Tom Parker, Dick Nesbitt, and Liz. And that's, that's almost unprecedented. I can't think of another institution that that is the case. And with that came you know, an incredible amount of stability. I said, when, when I was a director, it was perfectly possible that Fred and Phil could be in the, the office at the same time and with me. And that, those were the three sole directors of admission. And with that came, as I said, continuity. And generally, continuity can either, either lead to you know, real stability and good decision-making or, or staleness. In this case, I think it was good decision-making and, and whatnot. So I went down to Amherst with the idea 
I, I want to see what the problems are. Are the problems interesting to me? Um, and was in that kind of rare position of having a great job so that I felt that I could be utterly honest with them about my proposed solutions to uh, some of the difficulties and some of the problems and essentially say to them, this is what I'm going to do. You know, if, if that's what you want me to do, terrific. You know, if that frightens you or is sounds a little bit too turbulent, don't hire me and thanks for lunch and I'll, I'll go on home. Um, so they, they did in fact like what I was proposing and it made sense to them. Um, so I came to Amherst. I was very, very fortunate uh, that Katie Fretwell was the Dean of Admission and I could delegate a great deal because everything I had to do at that point was kind of high, high level policy making, uh, creating um, a policy making group, et cetera. Uh, and as I said earlier, Joe Paul Case was the most distinguished dean of admission or dean of financial aid in the country. So I, I didn't have to worry about those kind of details. And the um, first thing um, I did. Yeah. What year? What year did you become dean of admissions? 1999. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and so essentially, we replicated what Williams had done. And instead of having an advisory group on admission and financial aid, we had what was called the Faculty Committee on Admission and Financial Aid. And it, it really literally almost to a person uh, replicated uh, what Williams had done. And again, exactly the same effect that Williams. Transparency is the way to go. There's no question about it. And we were utterly transparent with the faculty, utterly transparent with the board etc utterly transparent with the coaches um and it, it worked out well and as i said we instituted the first no loan uh policy along with princeton um we did not coordinate that announcement it happened that that princeton did the same thing that we did ironically the director of the princeton office was a Williams grad uh, who worked with me in my first year at Williams. So there's a certain irony in that as well. Um, so those have been the big events at both uh, Williams and Amherst. Um, and there's many, 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 many stories I could tell, but I'm not going to. What I'm gonna talk about right now are the four areas. Essentially, one way to think about admission is that you admit four different classes um, and everybody now is wedded to the diversity of the student body and properly so. Um, I, I can't imagine, particularly as this nation is tearing up itself apart uh, along socioeconomic and racial lines, um, not having a student body that is going to be prepared to deal with the volatility that, that that we see moving forward and hopefully they provide some solutions and uh, some healing. Um, but to give you some notion of how diverse a student body is, at Amherst this year, over half of the students entering will be students of color uh, and another 10% will be non-US citizens. And for Williams, it will be very, very similar. Uh, many more first-generation college students than before. Um, in dealing with this kind of diversity, um, a lot of what happens is legally driven. What you can and can't do in terms of the admission of an African-American student or a Latino student uh, is, is very narrowly defined. So a good bit of work that's done in the admission office now is understanding what the Supreme Court allows and does not allow. Uh, but there's very, very clearly uh, a commitment to diversity. And I said, you know, earlier, I think the next step is what is the experience of an African American student at, 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 at Williams? What's the experience of a first generation uh, Mexican American student from El Paso? Uh, what are the differences in the way they lead their lives? Um, so that's the next step. The second group uh, would be athletes. Um, that again was governed by the 
financial aid task force that I alluded to earlier in the mid 80s, where we just said, well, how many football players are we actually taking who would not have been admitted otherwise? Uh, and it, we were at the point of compute, computing where we couldn't say, well, we don't know or tell some story or some anecdote. You know, it was it was easy to identify. And we came up with a system, you know, after interviewing coaches, the AD, faculty, key administrators of admitting 14 football players per year who otherwise would not have been admitted. And then two times the number of remaining sports. So the basketball team, for example, would get two, baseball team would get two, uh, and there had to be gender parity. So if men's basketball got two, women's basketball got two. And again, utterly transparent. I could say that to the board. I could say that to the faculty. I could say that to the president. And there was sort of mutual agreement. And again, as I said earlier, once they actually looked at the cohort, they said, these, these are really good kids. What are, what are we talking about? Well, you know, what's, what's, what's wrong with this? Um, and we monitored them as well. Did they do as well as predicted? Uh, how did they behave socially, et cetera? So there was a real kind of monitoring both of academic performance and behavior or socialization. Um, when I went to Amherst, there was no such transparency. Uh, there was no such system. If you remember, Amherst was bouncing back and forth between too little emphasis and too much emphasis, uh, real distrust among the faculty. So I immediately, literally immediately, I didn't wait for any consultation, uh, said, we're going to do the same thing here that we're doing at Williams. And by the way, Williams is doing just fine athletically. So you know, don't worry about that side of things. So we implemented the same thing uh, at Amherst. Uh, there was real cooperation between not only the deans of admission at both schools, but the presidents of both schools when we did this. Um, uh, myself and Dick Nesbitt and Morty Shapiro and Tom Garrity, who was the president at Amherst at the time, met in Charlemont, Massachusetts, and just went through this in, in detail. So we then uh, had, had precisely the same system. Uh, we then kind of threw the president of Wesleyan, got Wesleyan to agree to, to a similar system. They were very, very, very nervous about it. Um, but again, they implemented it um, and were a lot happier and actually more successful rather than less successful athletically. Two years after that, the entire NESCAC conference adopted these same guidelines, uh, which was 14 football players, twice the number, two times the number of the remaining sports. And in some cases, uh, for the first time, putting in kind of a, 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 a definition of what of, of, of a student that you just simply couldn't take, uh, which was already in place at Williams, uh, already in place at Amherst then in place at Wesleyan, and then Bowden, Bates, Colby, Bowden, uh, <laughs> Trinity uh, took us up on it as well. Um, so that the athletic part of it now is absolutely governed uh, by this. And the NESCAC schools at the end of August trade the names of all of the incoming athletes um, to be sure that there's adherence um to the particular standards now for those of you who can do the math and some some of you played athletics you realize that the basketball team is not going to be able to play with only eight players um so another six or seven or eight are going to be students who are at the very top end academically same with baseball you need nine players at least to play you can't play with eight um, and you probably need a squad of 20 to 22. So beyond the eight, all of the others are admitted for various other reasons, most of it being academic excellence. Um, legacies, um, same thing. Williams has worked very, very hard to have a coherent program because you don't want to admit students who are um, not going to 
take full advantage of the place or going to be un, unhappy or in over their heads academically. Williams was very active in terms of um, <coughs> making myself and senior people on my staff available to alumni for counseling. And it was my belief that you don't want to take anybody by surprise um, so that after the interview, as some of you may remember, there was a usually a consultation of some kind where I would say, hey, things look great, or you, you need to do this or that to be competitive, or this is probably not going to happen. I always felt it was better to, to do it face to face. Um, and I brought that same uh, philosophy to Amherst that we needed to be a lot more um, I, I don't say lax in terms of admitting legacies, but certainly in uh, caring for the legacies through the process. Uh, and we actually expanded upon what we were doing at, uh, at Williams uh, to have what we call Dean's Days, which were kinds of open houses uh, during the spring and summer for um, parents and their uh, students to learn about the process. Um, you're a little in bit the over the 40, 40 minutes. We want to leave time for questions. Okay, where am I? Okay. Um, final thing. The class is going to be raw power when you're talking about brilliant kids. And, you know, brilliant meaning minimum of 1550 on the SATs. Um, all of the achievement tests over 800. And that'll constitute about half of the class. Uh, and these these are... Uh, it's humbling to to read them. I, I never took calculus in high school. Um, I don't think they offered it. Uh, these are kids who are re who in high school are are studying mathematics beyond calculus. They're doing linear algebra at a community college or something. I like abs absolutely brilliant kids, wonderful kids. Um, but we can't even accept them all. Um, and then we started. Uh, sort by other personal qualities. So, you know, don't get hung up on the stereotypes that some people do that, okay, these 1550 kids are nerds or whatever the case might be. It's really quite the opposite. They're editors of the yearbook and presidents of the class and captains of the cross country team, et cetera. So with that, I'll conclude and, uh, and take questions and then thank you for your patience. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is to use that reaction button to raise your hand uh, or participants, you can raise your hand. But we had a few questions come in ahead of time, and I'll start off by asking Tom. Paul Lipoff had written to Tom. Uh, it started with the, the, the question about quotas. Yep. There was some um, either rumors or reality that when our <laughs> class came in and at Williams that only 10% of the class could be Jewish. And now some of the quota systems, you get a question about how many can be Asian, how many could be Chinese, how can make the X. So Tom, would you talk about particularly Paul's question since she was kind enough to write it in ahead of time and then talk about quotas. Okay, sure. Um, without question, uh, it, there's there's a book called The Half Open Door that documents this not only at Williams but Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Amherst, etc. Uh, no question that there were quotas for Jewish students in the 40s, 50s, and perhaps early 60s. And and you can you can you know it's it's astonishing to me to look back at it and because the statements are really quite blatant um, in terms of discussing you know the Harvard dean discussing you know the Jewish phenomenon with the Williams Dean and the president of Princeton talking up president of Yale about, you know, this influx of primarily Eastern European Jews and, you know, it's changing things and what do we do? And uh, I'm afraid the reaction was, you know, we're going to limit the number. Um, and it turns out it was probably one of the stupidest institutional decisions ever made. Um, and the rationale was, bizarre, which was somehow they're not like us, they're going to be unhappy, uh, they'll never give money, all of these things, all of which turns out to be bizarre because the Jewish community is among the most philanthropic communities in, in the United States, if not the most philanthropic. Um, so all the money that could have gone to Harvard went to CCNY and Brooklyn College and 
whatnot, which again, I just find ironic. Um, when I arrived, there was nothing to suggest that there was a, a quota of any kind. Um, and the last four presidents that Williams would are Jewish. Um, and if you have a transparent admission process, you know, I, I, I cannot imagine that a Jewish president would, would tolerate uh, anything remotely like a, like a quota. Um, however, I found that there were practices in recruiting that had the effect of, in my mind, and I don't think it was conscious. I think it was all momentum or lack of momentum. We did, we did not do the kind of recruiting in New York City, Long Island, Westchester County, New Jersey that we should have been doing. And I don't only mean um, Jewish students, but students, Catholic students from first generation families. They were, we were missing out on a lot. And it just happened that as I said earlier, I grew up in Brooklyn. I knew the schools inside and out. So it's not only that we're not going to Hunter College High School in Bronx Science, but we're not going to Regis High School, arguably the best Jesuit high school in the United States. And you know, we're, we're missing out. Um, and whereas we're recruiting hard in the Western suburbs of Boston, recruiting hard at the prep schools in New England and the private <laughs> private schools in Cleveland and whatnot. So I think the effect was, you know, not intended to uh, keep Jewish students out or to keep what we're, you know, Phil Smith once said, you know, Catholic scholarship boys um, out. But the effect of it, I think, was, um, and it, it, the other thing at that point, there had been until my first year, uh, no Jewish admission officers at, at at Williams. So it would have been possible, perhaps, you know, to have some sort of quota without anybody knowing it. But, uh, you know, that first year, there was one Jewish assistant director of admission, then the following year, an assi Jewish assistant director of admission, who became the number two or three person uh, on the staff until she retired. So that's, that's the best that I can do. Okay. Uh, I will say that Frank Oakley was a, a who, who you remember was a really pretty fierce advocate um, for uh, increasing the percentage of Jewish students. Number one, and making their experience on campus much better. He was the one really who was responsible for building the new beautiful Jewish center on campus. What had happened prior to that is the um, uh, the temple in in North Adams, which was. Uh, I believe conservative, um, uh, the Jewish population in North Adams just shrank and shrank and shrank and eventually that closed. So there really wasn't a viable option for Jewish students to pursue their lives here. Um, Rick Ackerley and then John Hefnagel and then I saw a question come up. So go ahead, Rick. So my question, you kept talking about uh, great students, you know, oh, just these were great students. Um, but what are the actually the criteria and and I well, yeah go ahead and I'm sure I'll have a follow up question. Okay, uh, so, you know there's there the each each file is read uh, cover to cover by two different admission officers and if there's a, a discrepancy of more than one point in the system a third person breaks the tie so it's read very very carefully so what's going to go into it are the obvious things SAT is quality of the academic program grades um and that'll that'll narrow down the population pretty well and then into it comes much more subjective things frankly that you're going to glean from the students essays from the uh, teacher recommendations from the secondary school report etc where you're looking i think for curiosity uh genuine commitment to to learning um creativity and all of those things you know, I have to say, are, are measured subjectively in the minds of, of the readers. Um, and out of all of that comes a, a, an index, uh, an academic index that's one to nine, one being the best, nine being the worst. You know, basically nine would say, person just simply can't do the work here. Um, 
and as I said, the the grades and the and, and the um, SATs provide you know sort of the first screen in a sense. Um, and then what do we do for the month of March? But discuss those who are in the running, and that's when you're talking about: is this a creative kid? Is this a kid who's really committed? That's what the faculty want: somebody who's really committed, you know, really loves literature, uh, really fascinated by physics. Uh, and it's a one person, one vote uh, system. What I always said to younger people joining the staff is, you guys are attorneys, you're not psychiatrists, um, and you're not actors. I don't want an emotional plea. If you're saying that someone's creative, I want you to point me to the evidence in the file that that person is creative or curious or any of those kinds of things. Um, and to be honest, 90% of the folders that you read are absolutely consistent. Uh, um, the kid with a 770 verbal writes the kind of essay that you would expect. The kind of guy with a 550 verbal writes the kind of essay that you would expect. 10% is where I always say we earn our money. Um, there are overachievers in this world who do much better uh, than their SATs might indicate they, that they would do. Uh, again, I say, if you're making that argument, I want evidence. I don't want a, you know, an emotional appeal. Um, likewise, there are students who are absolutely gifted, who are not performing at the level that they should be. And that can be for various reasons. Um, and again, that's where I ask for evidence. Why, why is this student, these scores that are off the charts, not, not doing as well as uh, you would predict. So those are the academic criteria. What's happened, and it's one of the reasons I'm glad that I'm uh, retired, is that I felt in my last couple of years at Amherst, and if anything, over the last five years, that's doubled, is that we were running out of meaningful criteria. Um, you know, where I said, okay, this has astronomical scores, straight A's, incredible program, amazing support from teachers and brilliant essays, but we still just don't have enough room. And I'm afraid that in my last couple of years, there were a couple of days where I came home and just said, you know, this is just too arbitrary. Um, and there's nothing I can do about it. I've exhausted every meaningful criterion, you know, take the kid from Alabama rather than New Jersey, which I don't really care to do, but I had to do something. Uh, and I found that it was a kind of a morale uh, problem for the younger people who were looking for guidance, of course, for me and other senior people. So anyway, that's a long-winded answer to the question. Um, I should also say that Williams and Namers do uh, serious validity studies, which is how well do we do predicting how well a student is going to do um, academically, and that's GPA. But at a small school like Williams, I can tell you, uh, if, if a student's doing poorly, I'm going to hear about it. Um, and they're going to know who the dean of admission is. Uh, at Amherst, I, I, we did, we, they had never done any validity studies. That's one of the, again, one of the first things I, I put in. But I also interviewed uh, all of the teachers who taught the first year seminar at Amherst and essentially uh, sat down with them for a morning, then an afternoon, morning, then an afternoon, and just said, tell me about the uh, 20 kids in your first year seminar, basically, you know, who are the superstars, you know, who are the, you know, good solid students and who are the bums if you have any. Um, and it, it was great to hear from them um, as well. So Rick, we'll come back to you. If we got other questions, time, okay. it will come back. We got time. Huff, you're next. Then yeah, Dave, just, Tom, you, you had mentioned that you do some monitoring or it did some monitoring and in terms of the uh the people going through the the process and then seeing it as they're there at school um did you find that you you thought uh differently having gone through that monitoring process where sometimes you feel geez i made a we made a mistake by getting too many people of this uh type or um we getting too many people who who are excelling in a way that that uh creates issues um, and I just wondered whether, what the mistakes were and, and sure, how sure. That, that changed things. 
Sure, that that that's a that's a great question. Um, again, Williams had has a superb office of institutional research. Ironically, Amherst had none. I, I don't mean a weak one. They it was absent, so I had to do a lot of the work myself. Um, there were some things that were we had discovered in the ten percent plan that many of you might remember, um, and most of you probably think you were part of the ten percent plan. I certainly do. Uh, John Hyde reported. Uh, that 60% of the freshman class in the class of 69 confessed to him sometime during their freshman year uh, that they were 10 percenters and were very fortunate but very nervous. So here's here's what I can say. Overachievers continue to overachieve. Um, so somebody with relatively, and I underline relatively, relatively uh, modest scores, you know, worked their fannies off um, at Williams and grew and probably did better on their LSATs than they may have done on their SATs. So that was lesson one. Underachievers continue to underachieve. So this kid with a very high score is marvelous intellectually oriented essay, but a B student should have been an A student. They pulled the same nonsense at Williams that they pulled in high school, which is, you know, writing the, the essay for English 101 at three o'clock in the morning before it's you know, the, the whole nonsense. And so that was definitively learned. Um, students with very rich extracurricular lives uh, overachieved modestly in the classroom, I think largely because they were happy, um, content, connected, all of those kinds of things. Um, so that was guiding us at Williams. Uh, mistakes that we made, there were, there were a couple, and, and um, this is where I, why I say providing insufficient support for first-generation students and students of color and not fully appreciating uh, you know, what their lives were like. You know, one of those sort of cute things that people say is wealthy kids have money sent to them when they're at college, poor kids send money home because they're working double shifts in the dining hall to help their families out. We didn't understand those things as well as uh, perhaps we should have. Um, so this is- the other, the other thing that I would say, schizophrenia, for example, is a late adolescent onset disease. Um, so kids who get in trouble, which you might call our mistakes, most often it's alcohol and drugs. Um, it's schizophrenia or a, a late, at, late onset adolescent disease, or it's a real crisis in the family. Um, there's an unfortunate phenomenon of parents who say, we'll get divorced once the kids go to college, um, forgetting that it can be a bombshell for a kid um, to suddenly realize that out of nowhere, uh, the divorce is taking place. So the other thing we discovered, John, that some of the sports cultures were bad. I, you know, I have to come, you know, say that where, you know, coaches can be terrific on the field, but I think they have to be terrific off the field as well. Um, and I got to Amherst, and I won't mention the particular sport, but I looked at the GPA of this particular sport, looked at the predicted GPA of the students in this particular sport, and they were underachieving. And they were underachieving not only on the soccer field, but they were underachieving in the classroom did the kind of research that that I did and discovered that particular sport had a very, very strong pot culture, um, pot culture. You know, they were smoking their brains out um, and that's not good. Um, so that would be another mistake. We remedied that one simply by, by changing coaches. Um, you know, ironically, the, the transparency also uh, it gives you a mechanism to evaluate along with the athletic director, uh, which coaches are doing a good job. And generally I find the coaches who are doing a good job on the field are also doing a good job off the field. They're very conscious of the academic progress of the students, very conscious of their social lives. Ted, I'll get to you in a minute, but uh, I wanna, and Dave Riker's got his hand up. But Mal Getz, if you unmute yourself, I don't want to misinterpret your question, which I think is a good one that Tom could comment on. Yes. Mal writes in the chat, what is the philosophy towards LGBTQ applicants? I don't quite know what you mean, Mal. So 
ask your question with some does it does it does it play a role in the admission process is it, you've listed a number of other categories that um, um, some influence sure. uh, um a we don't know we we're not asked the, that question is not asked at any point however i would say over the last decade students have been volunteering that information uh, much more freely than they would have been a decade ago for the same reasons that in the larger society we're talking about these issues and i would say yes in the sense of if there is a student who is playing a leadership role in any of the lbgt activities organizations whether it's at the school itself and my lord do you see a range of support in high schools for those students from welcoming to awful um you know almost blatant institutional homophobia. Um, so if you have a student who um, is exercising leadership and in, in many ways courage um, in, in doing that, um, yes, that is taken into account and is seen as a positive. One of the other things that I should say is that if a student is a terrific violinist, they're not gonna stop playing the violin. If a student is a terrific cross country runner, they're not gonna stop running cross country. If a student is playing a leadership role in a committee of that sort, they're going to do precisely the same thing at Williams. Um, and we certainly need it. So yes, I would say, along with many other kinds of leadership roles that is taken into account. And, and to be frank, I've been out of the business for five years. So my guess is that it's even more pronounced or obvious now than it was five years ago. I can't say me, that, but let me just... do this because the college, college we've got about five more minutes and I got Dave Riker and then Ted McPherson. And what I'm going to ask if it's all right with Tom, he volunteered uh, because we've got a lot more questions and obviously we, we could go on for a semester. Uh, Tom, you don't mind if, if on the listserv, we send out your email and people ask you questions individually by, via email or not? Oh, I'd be happy to take them, sure. Okay, so Dave, you're next. Dave Rager, then Ted McPherson. Oh, I'll, I'll follow up with Tom uh, via, via that, that option, given the shortage of time right okay. now. Good, um, and I know there was a few other questions in the chat that would be, you know, about legacy and other things that uh, Steve Watson asked and others might be better served by writing directly to Tom. Go ahead, Ted. I think you've been waiting to follow up. Hey, Tom, Ted McPherson here. Um, with your great experience, in your opinion, what are the most valuable results that the trustees and president of Williams College should produce in the foreseeable future to make it even a better college? Uh, I'm very satisfied with the financial aid policies of the college, very proud of them, in fact. Um, same with admission, same with faculty. I think the single biggest challenge right now is making life comfortable and equitable for a broad range of students so that no student is pre prevented from taking full advantage, that there's no student sitting in their room lonely that there's no student sitting in their room alienated. And that's that's tough work. Um, you know, when you're talking about the diversity, again, think about the challenge of the Mexican American female student from El Paso who is leaving her close knit family and has been number one in her class and suddenly is thrown into an environment where she doesn't know anybody. Um, how, do, how do we make sure that that student is having a positive academic experience and just as importantly, having a positive social experience. Um, and to be frank, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, it's, it's a very, very interesting phenomenon. For example, that student should be taking advantage of student of office hours for a faculty member to get the kind of support because she's gonna be asked to do things in what we would have called English 101 that she was simply not asked to do in high school. Whereas the student from Belmont Hill or St. Mark's in Dallas that you know so well 
has been. They're prepared. And one of the great ironies is the most well-prepared students are the ones who take best advantage of office hours because they don't see it as a shameful thing or uh, an index of failure. Whereas the, the student from El Paso might say, you know, I, <laughs> I've never had anything but an A or an A plus in my life. And, you know, I don't even understand what this question means. And, you know, what am I doing here? And, you know, if I go to the faculty member, I'm admitting that I'm, I'm not as good as everyone else all the while. You know, the kid from St. Mark's is saying, hey, this is terrific. And I was used to getting extra help and enrichment in, from my faculty. Um, so that's the single biggest thing. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, Tom, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a personal privilege here and ask the final question that is on the minds of a lot of writers and others and is on the minds of efficiency for admissions. If you eliminate by talking to two or three people in the admissions department, maybe 10% of the applicants, and you take the other applications and just throw them down the stairs and fill the class randomly, do you think you'd get a more efficient admissions and get a more diverse class? No, no. <laughs> but, but what I will say is that I, I'm glad I'm not in the business of admitting students out of a pool of 15,000 because, you know, for the last three, four or five, you, you have to say that it's random. You have no, no other choice. Um, and the, I'll, I'll close by saying, is the system itself broken? No, it's not. It, you know, and that's how I consoled myself in those last years is saying, heck, they're on the wait list at Williams, but they probably got into Amherst. If they're on the wait list at Amherst, they probably got into Swarthmore. If they're on the wait list at Swarthmore, they probably got into Williams. Um, so the system does sort kids in a rational manner, but it, it does feel random. There's no question about it. Tommy, I can't thank you enough on behalf of the class. And uh, it's a great lead into uh, our reunion time. T John Huffnagel will talk a bit about that before we go. But uh, Alan will send out Tom's email on listserv and there, there's all sorts of questions about um, you know whether financially the people who are paying full cost to go to to Williams or Amherst or subsidizing those that or is it come out of the uh, endowment there's all sorts of questions that people may want to sure. ask and different questions that Tom is very willing to explore with us and he's he's got nothing to do in the Williamstown other by but go out and walk so i'll answer all those questions uh, go ahead john well uh, tom thank you very much it was just a, thank that was you really guys. a wonder, wonderful talk and and really helps us a lot in terms of understanding things one of the things we're going to be doing during reunion is is talking about the 40 percent in our class that, that at the 50th reunion who said they were in the 10 percent Yes, exactly. um, <laughs> and I just wanted to say that to everybody, we, I see there's a, a lot of you are going to be at reunion. We've gotten the returns, but there's still an opportunity uh, to join us. And I, th I think it's going to be a very uh, fun and interesting time for all of us to be able to get together. And I would just hope that if you are not uh, uh, signed up as yet to, to please do so. Those who are will try and really deliver a, a, a great reunion. And, and uh, we've been working with with uh, Chris Robar, who worked with us, and many of you got to know her during our 50th reunion. And Chris is doing a great job from the college helping us out. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a nice experience. Going to be a lot of fun. And we've got some presenters all signed up for for two sessions. And looking forward very much to to just having an opportunity really to talk at reunion and to visit uh, and to not to rehash the old, but to talk about where we are in life. Um, so look forward to seeing all of you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, all. Tom, for your time. You're most kind to share the evening with us. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Great. All right. Thanks, Larry. Thank you all, guys. Thanks, Larry. Peace. Great.